Hi everyone, I am Gabby from the Singapore Art Museum and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's session, A Date with Sam Cheng Mala. This program is organized by the Singapore Art Museum and is centered on the work The Green Crab, a diagram of auspicious spatial organization, which is part of our multi-site exhibition, Lonely Vectors. This evening, I'm very pleased to introduce you to our speaker, artist Royce Ng of Zheng Mala, and moderating the session this evening, we have the guest curator, Yomi. Thank you both for joining us, and right now, I'd like to pass the time to the both of you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> thanks so much, Gabi, for introducing us, and thanks to Sam for hosting us tonight, and thanks to all the audience joining us. Uh, we do um, intend this to be a very casual chat and, and that will welcome everybody's comments and questions. Um, so as um, Gabby introduced us, um, we are pleased to have Royce in today, who is half of uh, Joe Mahler um, and whose practice um, looks at um, global economic history, trade relations, um, and also the, the hidden layers of um, Asian, Asian modernity. They also work um, with ancient and futuristic technology. I, I think I'll say a few words about the show, Joyce, before I pass it on sure. to you to speak more about the work itself. Yeah, so I am a guest curator of the Lonely Vectors um, exhibition, which is looking at um, infrastructures and networks that perform the global economy. With artists, we have been tracing different um, lines and networks. These include the agriculture and irrigation um, channels, trade and shipping routes, economic zonings, and migratory patterns. And all of that are engraved across the surface of the earth, and they're so integral to our contemporary lives that we sometimes don't even notice them. So we have this uh, mapping attempt, but at the same time, we have an unmapping attempt, which is to look at um, how this, um, the, the networks and, and, the, and, and um, uh, infrastructure, they do not necessarily exist in a smooth space, but rather there are toll points, there are exclusive zonings and uneven distributions. And one of the dimensions that we're particularly interested in is how we can imagine different kinds of infrastructures and different kinds of networks. So how can we connect uh, otherwise with um, the, the, the cosmological and the speculative dimension that are beyond this visible and traceable infrastructures? So in that sense, uh, we're very happy that, um, that John Mala has accepted to make a new commission. That is the work of um, the Green Crab that we're going to speak about. That is already up currently at the hoardings um, on the Queen Street and Brass Bassa Road. So with that, I think I'll pass it on to you, Royce, to walk us through the, the behind the scenes stories of the Green Crab. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, thank you to Sam and um, all the curators for inviting us to uh, participate in this exhibition and uh, for commissioning this work. Um, again, my name is Royce, um, I'm one half of Shang Mala, an artist collective. Um, the other half is uh, uh, my partner, Daisy Biznix, who's an anthropologist. Um, the um, Zheng Mala is a collective um, with uh, myself and Daisy at its centre, but we collaborate and work with um, a kind of rotating cast of um, uh, academics, um, experts, some um, other artists, performers, um, curators, um, and it kind of takes a different configuration each project we do. And um, in this work, um, Daisy was less involved and the core of the collaboration was between uh, myself, um, Ian Tan, an architectural historian based in Hong Kong, but uh, originally from Singapore, and um, also One Byte Studio, a design studio in uh, Hong Kong. And um, so we were given um, this commission uh, to do something for the hoarding about um, a bit over a year ago. And um, 
it was fraught with a lot of problems, the problems that everybody has been facing, all artists have been facing and trying to create work, um, site specific sensitive work at a distance. Um, so we're making something um, in one of the, the city center of Singapore, uh, various uh, hoardings, which is, um, needs to be very responsive to the sites and the history and, and the architecture. And um, uh, neither myself or Daisy had spent a lot of time in Singapore. And of course, we couldn't travel because of the quarantine measures in Hong Kong last year to do the kind of um, usual research we would on the, on, the, on the ground research field work that we, we would usually do to build up a work. So um, I guess I would caveat um, this, uh, uh, my description of this, um, artwork that we ended up producing, that it is very much about Singapore. Um, it is about history of Singapore and um, its architectural history and its development since independence and the various uh, kind of vectors which um, feed into that development. But at the same time, it is very much an outsider's point of view. It's the point of view of two artists based in Hong Kong, originally from Australia, and trying to understand um, Singapore from afar. And um, so all the misrepresentations and, um, and, uh, and a speculative kind of a, a projections that we have conjured in this work, uh, as usually as you see in a prologue to any academic text, every fault is purely our own and uh, there's no one else we can blame. Um, so, but I hope that everyone can take this work as it's intended, as, um, as an outsider's view of Singapore, but one which might hopefully allow um, local audiences to see their own city from a slightly different perspective. And um, it's, a, it's a slightly um, cliched reference, but I think Italo Calvino's Invisible Cities uh, is a propos here in that um, I feel like we are slightly like uh, Marco Polo kind of regaling um, Kublai Khan with tales of a city which we're basically conjuring in our minds. So I'm not sure how much bearing it has um, with the reality and hopefully we get to visit Singapore soon and try and um, match up um, the, 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 this imaginary Singapore we've constructed with the, the real thing. Um, so <clears throat> having said that, um, where does this work come from? What how did we develop it? Um, how did it um, uh, morph and evolve um, with, uh, uh, in light of all these kind of constraints that we had to work with? So um, one, one, uh, one thread of our work, which has been consistent from the very beginning, we've been practicing for about 12 or 13 years is that um, Daisy's an anthropologist and, and I'm an artist, um, but one of our earliest interests was um, in the economic relationship between Asia and Africa. And um, this is um, for two reasons. One is uh, my own family background. Um, my family, my mother's side of the family emigrated from China to Africa to Mozambique in the 19th century when there until the 70s. So it's become the basis of an interest in that relationship um, in my work. And uh, Daisy's original um, anthropological research um, for her honours thesis um, was on um, appropriate technology in Kenya. And um, we spent some time in Kenya and South, uh, South Africa about a decade ago working on projects and and um and uh and and so this kind of um i guess one of the key things we're interested in is um this relationship between asia and africa and this one particular question which arose very early on in our research after we moved to Hong Kong and we did this um, long-term project <clears throat> called A Season in Shell, where we were embedded in um, chunking mansions for a year, and produced an exhibition about the ab trade in abalone shells between um, the Red Sea and off the coast of Somaliland to Hong Kong, to China, to Switzerland. And there was this question of, um,
if you take a country, if we're, we're based in Hong Kong, we're in Asia and traveled throughout Asia the last um, 10 years, uh, a country like Singapore, for example, and a country like Ghana, who uh, became independent roughly at the same time in the early 60s from the British, their GDPs were roughly uh, commensurate. Um, but if you fast forward 20 years, 30 years um, into the present, um, Singapore's economy, the last time I checked, was the 13th biggest in the world, and um, Ghana's GDP has gone backwards since that time. And this was um, an interesting question for us, and one that we brought up when in our discussions with um, African traders and asylum seekers in the trunking mansions, like, what is the... How do you understand this from a developmental angle? And um, it's a kind of been a question which is was at the core of our work at the very beginning, like uh, almost a decade ago, and one which we've continuously tried to grapple with. And um, so in terms of this project, one thing to latch on to, uh, uh, which had a continuity with our previous work was to think about Singapore and Singaporean model. Since the exhibition is about infrastructure and the kind of speculative um, models for urbanization and architecture and, and um, development in Singapore, um, we were interested in thinking about the Singaporean model, the success of the Singaporean model and what elements of that um, um, could explain this extraordinary phenomenal success as an economic and, um, and you could say political entity. And um, <clears throat> so this, this became the kind of entry point for thinking about the work. And um, we took a few detours of different ideas of how to explore this, um, but still we kind of had a difficulty and um, so for me, one element to try to understand the Singaporean model and from speaking to Singaporean friends in Hong Kong, who are the absolute resource for trying to make this work, develop this work, um, was that Lee Kuan Yew played this fundamental role. And so um, I just had to read Lee Kuan Yew's autobiography um, from first world to third. And it's incredibly um, fascinating story. He's an incredible man. Um, and this first person narrative that he tells of uh, very, very pragmatically um, and systematically um, creating the city state of Singapore from this kind of um, Southeast Asian tropical backwater in the 1960s into this highly developed globalized um, financial hub and trading hub um, by the 1980s and the 1990s. Um, it's, it's, it's really a uh, extraordinary story. And um, I was really fascinated with the elements where he talks about um, how he urbanized Singapore and the, um, how he developed its economy. And this really, um, I, I think he has, he had a natural uh, talent for uh, political economy and um, how to um, accelerate the growth of a country, learning from uh, other leaders in Asia um, and consulting with them. And um, one thing that was really, really, uh, uh, overt in his strategy was to attract um, foreign investment, Western foreign investment in Singapore to turn it into a manufacturing hub and then eventually to become a kind of finance hub. And he very systematically um, did that. And one of the key elements in that strategy was that in order to attract uh, foreign companies to base their um, headquarters in Singapore, it needed to be comfortable for foreign managers and CEOs and workers from, for example, the US to bring their families. It had to be a comfortable environment where they could bring their families accustomed to the American way of life and American standards of, um, say, infrastructure and amenities. And so a, a part of the whole development um, uh, 
program for Singapore led by Lee Kuan Yew and the PAP were, um, was to uh, really terraform the city and make it in the model of this globalized westernized city that would be comfortable and attractive to um, Western investment through Western CEOs being able to bring their family and feel comfortable and feel like they weren't really traveling, they were in an international city. Um, and so they did it and it, they did it in the span of like 20 years and it's extraordinary. But then looking a bit deeper into um, this story, um, a really fascinating thing that I discovered was that in the 1980s, um, there was a, um, uh, a concern in the government that uh, Singapore was not uh, Asian enough. It had lost its Asian character in that tourists who were coming to Singapore where there was not enough uh, oriental mystique in quote unquote so this is directly uh, from the government reports um, that to attract uh, western tourists um, that in somehow in uh, Singapore's race to development to westernize to modernize that it had lost something um, of its actual cultural character and um, so there was that actual program to um, uh, you could uh, quote unquote re-orientalize um, uh, parts of Singapore to uh, artificially reinsert that um, kind of mystique into um, the city to make it attractive to Western tourists. And so part of that was the revitalization of the Hall Park Villa. Um, we could actually go two more slides, I think. Thank you. Uh, revitalization of the Porva Porpa Villa as this kind of um, theme park um, based on co Chinese cosmology. Um, another was the revitalization of Chinatown and also Little India. So that was a really fascinating um, uh, uh, factoid for us in our thinking about this work. Um, and then to um, and then. And began to engage with the Western commentaries on Singapore from architecture and urbanism and science fiction um, in the 1980s and 1990s. So if you could go back two slides, sorry, I've, uh, this is, <clears throat> I haven't ordered these slides in um, proper sequence. Um, and to uh, uh, go forward one slide, please. Forward. Forward one more, and again. Yeah. And um, so the two which stood out and um, also offered another key to the work to relate it back to previous work was an essay written by William Gibson, uh, I think in 1993 um, for Wired magazine where he was sent to Singapore and um, and wrote a piece called uh, Disneyland with the death penalty. Um, and uh, it actually got um, Wired magazine banned in Singapore or its circulation restricted. Um, and uh, he basically, um, Gibson basically hates Singapore, finds it boring and um, bureaucratic um, and complains about the architecture as being generic. And uh, I guess all the complaints which the government, uh, Singaporean government was responding to in the 1980s in that uh, saying that it had lost its, its essential character, um, its, its, its Oriental Asian character. So, um, and uh, and uh, similarly, um, Rem Koolhaas um, wrote an essay in the mid nineties um, called Potemkin Metropolis, where it yeah, uses that term as self-explanatory. I mean, so this, this idea of Singapore as being like a theme park, Disneyland with a death penalty, um, being boring, being generic, being a kind of tabula rasa um, with no uh, internal character that it had somehow been deracinated in that period of development in kind of restructuring itself for, um, to attract foreign direct investment. Um, and, um, but I, I think that this is the kind of, this is the 
the the point of kind of um, slippage, which was interesting to us, that it's almost like Singapore from 19, the early 1960s to the 1990s that re- accomplished something amazing as all the other Southeast Asian um, like tiger economies had in uh, accelerating their development rapidly for going from first world, uh, third world countries to first in the space of 20 or 30 years. And yet uh, the end result of that is uh, the West hates it or the West decides that Singapore is Disneyland with a death penalty, Potemkin metropolis. And that it's, uh, it's, it's almost like, what do you want from us? We did everything you said, and, but still it's not enough. And then now we're boring. Um, and uh, and the, the interesting thing about the, that uh, William Gibson essay is at the end, um, he flies over, he leaves Singapore in relief and he flies over Hong Kong. And uh, I think it's worth quoting at length. Um, uh, they were there at Changi. They were toting those big ticket Austrian machine pistols that looked like khaki plastic water guns. And I must have been starting to lose it because I saw a crumpled piece of paper on the spotless floor and started snapping pictures of it. They didn't really like that. They gave me a stern look when they came over to pick it up and carry it away. So I avoided eye contact, straightened my tie, and assumed the position that would eventually get me on the Cathay Pacific flight to Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, I'd seen a huge matte black butterfly flapping around the customs hall, nobody paying them the least attention. I'd caught a glimpse of the walled city of Kowloon too. Maybe I could catch another before the future comes to tear it down. Traditionally, the homes of pork butchers, unlicensed denturists, and dealers in heroin. The walled city still stands at the foot of a runway, awaiting demolition, some kind of profound embarrassment to modern China. Its clearance has long been made a condition of the looming change of hands. Hive of dream, those mismatched, uncalculated windows, how they seem to absorb all the frantic activity of Kaitak Airport, sucking in energy like a black hole. I was ready for something like that. I loosened my tie, clearing Singapore air, and airspace. So, so somehow this Gibson um, really positioning Singapore and Hong Kong as uh, antithetical to each other, that somehow you can see in this passage itself that Gibbs, uh, Hong Kong is ripe for kind of techno orientalist projection. I mean, William Gibson, the progenitor of cyberpunk, no less, finds something in, in Hong Kong, in the walled city of Kowloon, no less, this kind of decrepit um, anachronism, um, which itself is kind of the one of the architectural models for the cyberpunk city. This is what William Gibson and perhaps the West wants from an Asian city, not Singapore, not a kind of artificial mirror of the West. Um, and so this uh, led to uh, allowed us to make a direct connection to a previous work, um, which is the next slide, um, Naomi, uh, with the, which we produced in 2019 called Nostalgia Machines. And that was essentially about this topic, about um, uh, the techno orientalist perception of um, Hong Kong and the kind of cyberpunk vapor wave kind of imaginary of what Hong Kong is and going to the roots of cyberpunk, which um, various theorists um, have interpreted as the West's dystopian fear of the rise of Japan, the economic rise of Japan in the 1980s, and how um, in this work we suggest that this fear is re-emerging, yet that fear is displaced onto the rise of China um, at the moment, and that uh, Hong Kong and the re-emergence of cyberpunk and vaporwave as an aesthetic is kind of a, a, a realization of that, but also how this there are a whole heap of other elements playing into this. One of these is the Japanese perception of Hong Kong beginning in the 1990s and how Hong Kong has been mediated through this kind of techno orientalist lens since the 1990s and the various sub techno orient uh, imperialism, techno oriental uh, imperialisms which are at play there. And then also thinking about the future um, of uh, Hong Kong and China and um, how those kind of 
um, various competing visions of the future play out through technology. And so somehow Nostalgia Machines was about Hong Kong, about various um, projections and phantasms and um, perceptions of the city. Um, and so we kind of anticipated that there could be something interesting to look at Singapore as the opposite of that through the frame of uh, William Gibson and these Western um, uh, uh, perceptions of Singapore. And then I guess this all is just behind the scenes as um, maybe too far behind the scenes, but uh, as uh, uh, Yumi suggested, um, I describe, um, which led to the kind of key to unlocking the work, um, which is event will uh, lead, led to what the work became. Uh, uh, and that is, uh, we spoke to, again, uh, to this process of, I just didn't want to make it like this. It felt like such high stakes. And we didn't want to make a mistake of like making a statement about a city that we don't know it well at all. And so we we're just constantly grilling Singaporean friends in Hong Kong. And then we met up with Ian, um, who was just a wealth of information. And then um, a friend of ours, Alicia, um, Singaporean based in Hong Kong at the moment, she told us the story. If we could go back to the first slide. Yep. So she I would essentially just asked her, what's something interesting about Singapore that like, what's an interesting urban legend or myth that could be that only a local know that we could would know and that we could use to like um, uh, latch onto and develop a work around. And just randomly, she said, uh, and that would relate somehow all of these topics of urbanization and development and the Singaporean models that we're interested in. And just randomly, she um, brought up this um, urban legend story myth that um, when they were building the MRT system in um, Singapore, that um, uh, apparently Lee Kuan Yew would uh, consult his Feng Shui master, Grand Master uh, Hong Chun um, from the Pokaksi Monastery. And um, he said that digging all these holes under Singapore would um, allow the chi to um, flow out and disappear and it wasn't being kind of captured in the city anymore and how could this and that this needed to be remedied. And um, the Grand Master suggested that everyone should carry a bagua um, and uh, it was Lee Kuan Yew's alleged uh, brilliant idea to um, shape the old Singaporean one dollar coin with these eight sides to mimic the shape of the bagua so that everyone would be carrying one in their pocket in Singapore and thus um, uh, 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 allow the uh, stop the, uh, the chi from escaping the city. And that was a really interesting story. Um, for us, uh, particularly in relation to having read uh, Lee Kuan Yew's autobiography and how he is so often explicitly at pains to describe how they're westernizing the city and they're modernizing this, the city. And um, it's all about development infrastructure and kind of making a break with the past. But the fact is that at some level, and this is all alleged and speculative that maybe there is a hidden spiritual dimension in Hong Kong, which guided a lot of Lee Kuan Yew's uh, decisions in um, redeveloping the city based on Chinese cosmology and metaphysics and, and Feng Shui explicitly, um, kind of opened a key to us of like, okay, like, given all this background, all these various kind of um, themes they're interested in, maybe one way to like make a statement against um, the kind of the William Gibson westernized perception of, of Singapore as a tabula rasa. Let's just assert a, a, another parallel dimension for understanding Singapore, this speculative metaphysical Chinese cosmological dimension. Um, and uh, just to, we could go to the uh, next uh, slide with a short video clip, just to uh, illustrate the kind of um, contradictions in this. MM Lee's public persona may be that of a star. Right. I don't believe in love at first sight. I think it's a good characteristic. <laughs> go back 10. Yeah. Utter rubbish. <laughs> 
Jakarta rubbish. Look, I'm a pra pragmatic, practical fellow. I do not believe in horoscopes. I do not believe in feng shui. But, and I don't, I'm not superstitious about numbers. But if you have a house... That's probably enough. Other people think is... So I guess that encapsulates the contradictions and paradoxes and what's interesting. Um, if you Google Li Kuan Yu Feng Shui, the first two things that come up are literally that urban legend about the $1 coin and the Bagua and this clip of Li Kuan Yu calling Feng Shui utter rubbish. Um, so our work is situated in the nexus of all these various points. And um, yeah, I think that sets up the stage for actually talking about the work thoroughly. Yeah. And I'm going to let my cat out. Oh, you're muted. Um, Royce, I suppose that many of the audience have seen the work, but since we're recording this and, and probably there will be people uh, watching this in the far future, do you want to show um, some of the, the, the snapshots from the work itself? Sure. Um, and especially maybe try to explain some of the urban myth, uh, urban myth behind that. Um, for those who are more interested in the feng shui aspect of the story, I just want to flag it that we do have another chat uh, coming up with uh, Master Tan himself, who has written the book, um, The Secrets of the Five Dragons, Feng Shui and Singapore's Success, which um, also forms the backbone of your research. Yeah, um, I think uh, I would never claim to be a feng shui expert. So it's definitely those who are... Uh, interested in that element of how we delved into that, we were heavily reliant on Master Tan's book and um, and also just collecting all these um, Feng Shui stories um, from Singapore, um, basically off the internet because we were doing all this research from afar. You could go back one slide maybe. So, after speaking to Ian, and it's something we came across um, in message boards and blogs and forums, um, if you, one interpretation of Singapore is that uh, the kind of animal symbol that you would fit over a map of Singapore would be uh, a crab. And um, there's two dimensions to that. So one is, uh, I wish we could find a source, but all of this is alleged and anecdotal. The Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew has persistent practice of Feng Shui and believes that Singapore will prosper only by being a green crab, the colour of a live crab covered with trees, rather than a red dead crab with only barren soil, at least according to an interesting Singapore Feng Shui myth I heard today. Um, so th that's the direct inspiration for the title, and we kind of create a green, red crab, the green and the red are kind of battling it out between the barren soil and this uh, green, um, greening of, Hong Kong, uh, of Singapore, but it's also artificial greening of Singapore in that uh, they had to actually, uh, it, as, as uh, I found out in um, reading Lee Kuan Yew's autobiography, that they had to um, remove a lot of the natural uh, environment in order to re-green it. So it's this kind of, uh, again, this artificial ersatz greenery. So that's why we have this kind of um, interplay between the green and the red and um, how the title is slightly ironic and plays with uh, this notion. But there's another political dimension, which Ian actually explained to us that the, the green, uh, the crab situated um, on the map of Singapore, it's, it's like its body, would be at the center of this kind of green heart around Pierce's Reservoir in the center, um, which is kind of like the green belts of, uh, um, of Singapore, which is essential for a, a nation without a hinterland. Um, uh, but also politically that the right pincer and Tanjong Paga was um, the constituency of uh, Lee Kuan Yew, uh, the first, um, 
Prime Minister, and the left fencer is Citroen Marine Parade, which is the constituency of Go Chok Tong. And so that was another political dimension of like understanding how the green crab could be used to view uh, Singapore. But the other one we actually drew more heavily on, which is, I think, the previous slide. Uh, no, sorry, maybe the next, uh, go forward. Forward, forward. No, you're going backwards, forward. Uh, well, maybe it's been removed. Oh, anyway, Master Tan's book. Um, it's basically called um, uh, The Five Dragons, The Secret of uh, Singapore's Success. And he actually places five dragons over um, Singapore, which are basically the five dragons running down from the mountains. There are no mountains really in Singapore. Um, and so, uh, but in the model of the ideal feng shui city you kind of have mountains behind waters in front and you try to have the center of the city in between those two and that you have these dragon uh, veins coming down from the mountains leading to a dragon's den so that the chi and positive and uh, chi flows can collect in the dragon's den and bring prosperity to the city which is why a city like uh, hong kong is considered very auspicious in feng shui and then we have the peak and these mountains, or you could see the uh, Gaolong, the nine dragons coming down and the mountains of Mao and Shan, and then you have the harbour, and then you have you know, the city centre. Um, but uh, th this is basically a, a, a kind of conundrum for all Feng Shui practitioners in Singapore that in the geography of Singapore, how do you fit it in with this Feng Shui model? So there's a lot of creativity involved. Um, so he, uh, Master Tan, uh, situated these five dragons as these five dragon veins leading to the city center. Um, and, uh, and it was also a problem for us. Um, so in Master Tan's book, he, he situates the mountains um, behind uh Singapore as being in um uh Malaysia and Sumatra so he actually steps outside of the bounds of Singapore to like so that there can be some kind of um the this uh geographical feature that would correspond with uh with the feng shui principles of a world uh, 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 <coughs> a, a geographically auspicious kind of uh, uh location um but what we actually um, did was to um, actualize that in the work. Um, and I mean, it's another entirely different dimension in the work, which we had to grapple with was um, the dimensions of the hoardings, which are, I think in, um, in uh, Bras Basa, it's 86 meters by five meters. So it's this incredibly long, long and narrow, thing and so how do you actually what kind of composition can you fit on that and it's also has to be kind of viewed from a different distance it's a public artwork um and i mean and so the obvious solution to this and it was suggested um by ian was to use a axonometric view so basically borrow from chinese painting and create these like multiple perspectives you can see that there um but then how to actually create an axonometric view of singapore which is this island um so if you go back a few slides to the um the malkun map yeah so, and this was, the, again, all credit to Ian here. He suggested this. Um, this is the Malkun map of Zheng He, the Ming Dynasty uh, Muslim eunuch admiral who um, sailed throughout um, Southeast Asia all the way to uh, the east coast of Africa. Incidentally, the, the name of our collective Zheng Mala, Zheng is actually a reference to Zheng He as the... Um, uh, <clears throat> first Chinese to travel to Africa. And, um, but the, the interesting thing about these maps that he produced is that they're coastal maps as a um, ocean navigator would really only be interested in the coasts. And so what he does is he unwraps 
the anywhere he visits it's basically one straight line which fits in one of these axonometric views that are tra um, traditional in Chinese uh, painting um, but it's a really interesting device for us to unwrap the coastline of Singapore and make a kind of uh, more of an inland empire and and that's exactly what we did so you can kind of discern where Singapore was here and this is the basis of how we um, fit the map onto these uh, 86 by 5 meter dimensions of uh, the hoardings. Uh, so we could go forward and actually look at the work. Yeah. Yeah, well, Roy, it was, it was actually interesting to hear you unpack um, the, the back, uh, background story of the, of the painting scroll um, in a way that it was a pragmatic solution. But there's so much more, there's so many layers to um, Chinese landscape painting um, that connects the painting itself to uh, different, um, mostly Taoistic practices. Right, so you have um, people arguing that in the very beginning, when landscape paintings were not considered paintings themselves, they were they actually served as a kind of map for the Taoist practitioners uh, when they went into mountains looking for elixir, and and so the the map itself would also serve as a kind of talisman. Um, there's a Taiwanese scholar um, by the name of Huang Jingjin who, who who looks into these early stories. And then in another version, you have Taoist practitioners who um, essentially imagine themselves as winged beings and, you know, flying, taking a, a, a trans trip over a certain um, mountain landscape. And the result of that uh, trip is, is uh, what we know today as landscape painting. So these mm -hmm. are highly um, charged and layered and also um, spiritual um, maps in some ways, right? And I think in a way, when, we, when people look at your works, there is a little bit of that, that which I suppose from, for you, it doesn't come from the Taoist tradition, but from another tradition, which is psychedelics and that connects to the, mm, your, your yeah. other research. So I wonder if we can go into that direction a little bit. Oh, that's really fascinating. I actually completely didn't know that. And uh, uh, a friend, uh, Lisa Park, she did suggest, I was talking about this project earlier on, and she did suggest the reference of the Neijing Tu, uh, the, the, these kind of tower kind of meditation maps, which use these kind of uh, contorted animal kind of figures around the, the map and resemble this. But I didn't know about these, um, these kind of uh, out-of-body experiences that um, the Taoist practitioners would have in and that would uh, create these um, these uh, multi perspective perspective isometric kind of paintings, and yeah, and this is one of the questions that um, we got after presenting the piece of uh, what's the basis of the kind of psychedelic uh, element in the piece, and actually that was completely unintentional, or like it's it was completely out of left field. Uh, I, I, I'm doing a PhD basically in psychedelics, but uh, it wasn't um, something that um, uh, we consciously fed into the work, but I guess it just comes out anyway. But it's also fortuitous that you can um, read in all these different elements into it. Um, but uh, yeah, the psychedelic, I mean, we talked about this earlier and that uh, uh, I, I do see psychedelic culture in, in, as it emerged with Albert Hoffman in the 1930s, 1940s in the West as this kind of re-emergence of the spiritual, of the cosmological into Western thought after, you know, Nietzsche and the kind of uh, enlightenment and this kind of suppression of the, the, the mystical and the cosmological and the separation of um, <clears throat> that from technology, as we, we talk about Yokoi as well. Um, and... Uh, so I think that element of like hovering in between like the cosmological and um, the, the real and the practical is um, something which would be analogous to what we're trying to do with this piece and bringing in this spiritual metaphysical dimension of 
uh, speculative dimension of Singapore and then situating it within the, you know, the real architecture of Singapore at the same time and seeing how those interweave and flow and, and I guess in some ways trying to overcome that separation and trying to step it back a bit and um, have a more harmonious kind of synergy between the two. Yeah, so I guess, yeah, in, in that sense, your work is also a, a comment on maybe the state of um, cosmology or cosmological thinking, because uh, we do have, on the one hand, uh, you also mentioned Yu Kui, who proposes that this idea of cosmotechnics, which, you know, um, uh, aims to reground technology into a more holistic system that also has this cosmological dimension. Um, but at the same time, it's, it seems that all of these cosmologies are being used um, for um, uh, business gains or for, you know, feng shui masters helping uh, politicians in their political campaigns or in trying yeah. to understand the geopolitics of today, right? So, so I, I mean, I, I just, as you were speaking, because you also mentioned this whole accelerationism or the, the, the the actually existing capitalistic acceleration or nism in Singapore. Um, and I wonder if we're witnessing something that's like a like an ancient or cosmological acceleration right now. Well, yeah, I mean, these are all really controversial, fascinating topics. But I think like taking from, I mean, just York's work is incredibly I mean, to use a cliche, it's, parad it was a parad it's a paradigm shift in philosophy, especially like from the Asian perspective and incredibly influential on all artists and, and, and thinkers. I think the moment in Asia, if not the West and, and, and um, the global South. Um, but then I, I've always, I'm preparing a, um, a presentation for next month as well on this topic, but I've always had this worry, I guess, um, uh, that the alternative to the Western ontology of technology, um, if it's Chinese cosmotechnics or Amazonian cosmotechnics or uh, Australian indigenous cosmotechnics, it may not, particularly in the East Asian context, it may not uh, provide some kind of utopian alternative to the West. Maybe it is of kind of more dystopian or a dark cosmotechnics, which could possibly be worse. As you say, that um, a recent example is the uh, uh, the newly elected South Korean president um, in the presidential debate. He's quite famous for uh, in, in the first debate of having the Chinese um, character for king written on his hand as a kind of power move to. Um, <laughs> against the, his opponents and um, apparently he's very very close to his shaman um, and he was advised to do that and that Feng Shui as we know in Hong Kong it's all about they build these water features around the um, all the banks to allow the flow of money um, and uh, it's it's so much tied up with um, basically East Asian crony capitalism um, and uh, so how we can see uh, the cosmology as liberatory is, um, is I think, something that needs to be investigated. And of course, we brought it up last time we spoke, but um, Yokoi does have this um, uh, amazing um, essay in Eflux from about five years ago called The Unhappy Consciousness of the Neo-Reactionaries, where he talks about um, the accelerationists and um, NRX and Curtis Yavin. And, and um, one thing uh, he does talk about is the accelerationists uh, valorization, kind of extolling the virtues of um, East Asian techno authoritarian capitalism as the kind of ideal state or actually where they would like to see um, uh, the West head towards. Um, and you can also, in that context, you can also think of, uh, even I remember like 15 years ago, Slavoj Žižek saying that he thought that uh, the, the, the icon of the future would be Lee Kuan Yew. 
and that uh, he that actually the East Asian model of capitalism would be the model for the rest of the world in the future, and that there would be statues of Lee Kuan Yew in every city as the kind of uh, um, I don't know. John Maynard Keynes or something of of of, 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 uh, of uh, East Asian developmental state capitalism. Um, so that element of um, uh, Sino futurism and uh, the uh, the East Asian developmental state model. I mean, this ties right back to what um, we'll be, uh, I was speaking about at the beginning about the Singaporean model, East Asian model, about what was what's unique about this um, uh, this model in Asia, which allowed it to leapfrog to accelerate this development. There's a line in um, Yuk's essay, which is. Um, he calls uh, Deng Xiaoping the uh, most uh, accelerationist leader par excellence. Um, China is an accelerationist uh, country um, in what they did uh, with the reform and opening up in the 80s. And um, I mean, yeah, I'm not, I don't have it. This is, I mean, this is basically the core of the question of, of, of what I'm interested in and um, in my personal work and um, through threads in Shi Ma. Yeah, I guess we need to call it that accelerationism, right? Because it was originally proposed as a as a sort of speculative, philosophical kind of horizon, which we can we can question what it means if we push capitalism to to acceleration, um, to a point that it will break itself. And uh, I think what we're witnessing, in as as far as Singapore is concerned, uh, is a kind of very Day nine <laughs> acceleration, right? So it's ac accelerating, but it's also um, making sure that everybody it takes everybody on board, and you know it keeps this redistributing um, um, uh, the, the, the 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 yeah the, the gains from 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 the um, from progress and development. So in a sense, it's quite self contradictory. So it's kind of accelerating and decelerating at the same time, or maybe it's mm. just. Yeah, maybe it, 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 yeah, it comes out as a, as a new model of development. I mean, I think we do have um, too much maybe of a binary view, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like either a cosmological war, technological. Um, and, and, and recently Benjamin Breton wrote a quite interesting text um, kind of answering to Uke's, um essentially trying to put his uh, theory of the set and, and Uke's cosmo, uh, cosmotechnics together. And for him, um, he sees that uh, this is not Uke's original intention, but many people reading that uh, and, and, and developing projects from there can go into a place where divergence becomes both the means and the ends. Right? And that's not what we need because it's not really helping us to go anywhere. So what Benjamin is arguing is that we need some kind of baseline technological um, understanding of what is technologically viable to mm -hmm. help us from, um, from the crisis that we're facing. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> yeah, let's see, we are slowly running out of time. Um, and uh, I'd like to invite our audiences to ask anything that you might, Want to ask Royce? I do believe Ian is in the audience. He might have some softball questions for me. Unfortunately, we couldn't get him online tonight. He's actually in quarantine in Hong Kong at the moment. Um, but he will be joining the session in July with Master Turn. Well, if there are no questions, Oh, oh sorry, question. Okay, so 
And then, yeah, that's a we're 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 in such an abstract realm that um we haven't really spoken about really practical questions. Uh, so, um, <laughs> the Feng Shui of Bitcoin. Another question. I think you can answer that. Um, I'll let you, so yeah, if you I'll can, if you can see on the image that's currently on, um, uh, this is on the Queen Street site, and so this is like an annotated version of the map. So you can see numbers over the different sites and um, has a, a kind of legend on the right hand side. So you can find the street names and the corresponding feng shui animal. Um, but still, it's not, it doesn't give the uh, full depth of um, uh, the feng shui meaning of all of these sites because it's, it's basically a 300 page book. Um, and so there are a lot of limitations in doing. It's the first time we've ever really done a public work like this. And this kind of, um, the way you engage with public works is, it's kind of like a blunt tool, but a very, very powerful one. Um, but I think uh, often you have to speak to the back of the audience, as they say, in um, uh, rather than the kind of, it's not, it's not intimate. Um, so a lot of these details get lost. So um, one thing is I would just like people to spend time for the work and try to like unravel it themselves, like people, locals who know Singapore better than we do. And hopefully, as I said at the beginning, that they could um, look at various details. And uh, I mean, for example, uh, uh, the Lee Kuan Yew is in there. So it's a kind of where's Wally. Um, of various details we've inserted in there. So if you can spend some time to find that. But um, so there is going to be uh, an accompanying uh, virtual um, uh, environment for this piece, which will be, uh, the, hopefully it will be on um, desktop and on, on phone where people would actually be able to um, navigate the environment with an avatar. And when you um, hover over, um, the different features, um, the the animal will speak to you and reveal its secret. And so we're hoping that that would be, and we're hoping to get that out by late July or August so that at least it'll be um, available so that while the hoardings is still up and so that people could uh, engage with it and uh, try to um, unravel some of these layers. And Before we the, jump... Yeah, before yeah. we jump to the, the, the next question, I, I, I point uh, I would point um, um, the uh, the person asking the question about the feng shui aspect of Bitcoin, maybe to our next conversation with Master Tan himself, because I do think um, I do think Bitcoin entails a different form of accumulation and and you know the way that the way that it doesn't quite fit into the the, the current legal um, structures might mean that there is a different kind of feng shui. Uh, interpretation of that. Um, and also actually the question also reminds me of um, Nora Khan's writing um, AI in which she compares AI, this kind of very inhuman and monstrous technology to uh, wind and, and to think in a more um, yeah, poetic way of, um, of, of thinking how we can relate to these um, technologies differently. Um, but that is for the Feng Shui and Bitcoin question. Luis, do you want to pick up the next one? I mean, just, just on that, just uh, anecdotally, in Hong Kong now, there's a kind of Bitcoin mania. And um, in the, if you just a new financial product you've seen like conferences where they're just throwing around words these buzzwords like um uh, blockchain bitcoin and nfts and i think they're just you just attach that to any kind of business idea and it seems to be almost like a form of good luck to do that without any knowledge of meaning it's like a kind of cargo cult version of those this technology which is um uh, gain currency. So the the next question is about the the whole power uh, mansion and how is that um, how does it work as a source for this and your other works? Yeah, I mean it's a I think it's a quite clear visual reference, um, but 
uh, on the other level that uh, it explicitly deals with Chinese cosmology and uh, and Chinese mythology, and that it's also connecting Hong Kong and Singapore as this kind of spiritual undercurrent, which is, you know, uh, if you look it up, if you look at images of it, and it's 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 always described as like tacky and cliched and touristic. And as I mentioned in the beginning, the how Hopa um, Villa was revitalized as a part of this reor reorientalizing of Singapore. Um, but uh, it's not for us to like. I feel like, uh, irrespective of its aesthetics, I think it's, it's supremely interesting and in, like that it's asserting this uh, alternate layer. And even though it's disregarded as kind of kitsch, um, I think it's one which is um, uh, valid in understanding both cities. And that's why we've kind of had the reference to it. And also again, to the level of an amusement park. So I think um, for us, this work is, I mean, another question we'll ask recently, like is the work satirical? And um, it could possibly be viewed that way, like, and uh, like a kind of uh, 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 a complementary question was um, something along the lines of, um, do you think Feng Shui is scientifically valid or something like that? And um, for for us, it's not about making some statement about whether um, Feng Shui is real or not, but um, uh, it's a first principle. It's a metaphysics upon which the Chinese culture was based. And um, in the same way to understand like Western Enlightenment thinking, you should probably look at esoteric writings and hermeticism and Gnosticism to understand that. It's not to say whether all alchemy is uh, true or not, it's to understand what are the roots and how can you see those kind of um, elements play out in um, the contemporary version of that culture. Um, so yeah, for, uh, Hopa Mansion kind of represents that for us. Being conscious of time, I'd like to say thank you so much, Royce, for this very, very thoughtful um, talk. Um, there are so many layers to discover. And uh, for those on site, you are welcome to go there and check out everything. And for those of us who are not there, uh, we're looking forward to the virtual version of that. So let's pass it back to uh, Gabby. Yes, thank you so much um, to Voice and also Yumi for this very insightful and also very thorough discussion. Um, once again, we just like to remind you that this program, Adit Sam Jamala, is held in conjunction with the Green Crab, a diagram of auspicious spatial um, organization. And the artwork is part of Sam's multi venue exhibition, Lonely Vectors, which you can find. Um, uh, on the hoarding around Sands Bras Passa Road and Queen Street building. So you can actually head down to catch it in person, like what Yomi said, um, until the 28th of August, 2022. So we really hope to see you there. <laughs>